Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this very beautiful part of Newfoundland. It's my first time, and uh, I must say I'm already in love with the region, and I will be coming back, and next time it will be for longer. Um, but um, So the reason I'm here today is I've been doing some work with the Shorefast Foundation, and, um, and so I want to share with you some of those experiences, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time today talking about what is social entrepreneurship. Um, I think Penny will be discussing that in, in a bit of detail um, after me. And Mike did such a great job of explaining what social enterprise is and social entrepreneurship is that I don't feel like I need to go into a, a huge amount of detail. But I'd rather, uh, I'd prefer to, sh to give examples of what social un entrepreneurship looks like by giving you some examples from the Shorefast Foundation on Fogo Island. So, um, just briefly, I, I take a very broad perspective of social entrepreneurship. Um, I view it as uh, any kind of activity or, or an organization that aims to do good in society uh, and that uses business principles to achieve those goals, as Mike explained. And when I'm teaching, so I teach in a business school, and when I teach students about uh, social ent entrepreneurship, there's these classic textbook examples that I often use because they're, they're such popular examples. And one is the Grameen Bank, this idea of micro-lending to the poor in Bangladesh and how that's lifted a lot of people out of poverty, but it's also made these micro-lenders some money because they charge interest. And so there's, a com uh, there's an example of combining social goals with economic goals. And the other example that often comes up is Jeff Skoll. And you may or may not know, uh, but he was the first president of eBay. He made a lot of money, and then he became a social entrepreneur, started a movie company, and made movies that make a difference to society. And one of the movies that he made was the documentary An Inconvenient Truth. Um, and that that movie ended up, that documentary ended up making a lot of money. It was a box office hit. It won Academy Awards. Um, but um, it also ended up really changing the way people thought about climate change, and it really highlighted the urgency of this issue for society. And so another example of combining social and economic goals. But I started to feel like I wanted to teach my students about local examples of what, what is social entrepreneurship, what does that look like in Newfoundland? And so I was really drawn to the Shorefast Foundation's work. And um, initially, when I started to learn about the Shorefast Foundation's work um, a few years ago, it was all through um, media articles, newspaper articles. And, um, and so I didn't know a whole lot about it. All I knew was, was that there was this big five-star luxury hotel being built on Fogo Island. And I also knew that there were these really kind of cool-looking um, artist studios that were popping up all over the island. Uh, attracting artists from um, all over the world to Fogo Island. And so I thought, you know, I should really go to Fogo Island and try to find out what exactly it is they're doing beyond all of this media hype that I was hearing. And so off I went to Fogo Island and uh, I discovered that like many rural communities in Newfoundland, and I've done a fair amount of traveling around Newfoundland, that it's a really beautiful, you know, place, uh, ruggedly beautiful. Um, where uh, traditions uh, and history are very much alive and where um, ties to the fishery are still very much, uh, very prominent. And there's a real history of, of tenacity and, um, and a deep, deep respect and, and uh, ties, deep ties to the past. And, of course, a sense of humor. Um, this is, of course, referring to uh, Brimstone Head, which is one of the four corners of the flat earth. And uh, there's a photo of it there. So um, I was really intrigued, uh, not so much by the Shorefast Foundation's work, but more by Fogo Island and its, its history. And so I started to learn more about the history of Fogo Island I learned about the Fogo process, uh, these films that uh, were made in the 1960s on Fogo Island at a time when Fogo Island faced the threat of resettlement and how these communities who really didn't talk to one another uh, started to actually have conversations because of this process, this, these films that were being made in partnership with the National Film Board and Memorial Extension. And so these communities came together and they found a way 
to create a future on Fogo Island so that they didn't have to leave uh, Fogo Island, so they that they didn't have to resettle. Um, but of course, as we all know, this story, um, you know, came to a bit of a, a, a close in 1992 with the Cod Moratorium. And then we saw all over rural Newfoundland a dramatic decline in population. And the, this is where the story of uh, Zita Cobb begins. And you may or may not know a lot uh, about Zita, but she is quite profiled quite a lot in the media. So, um, But for those of you who don't know, uh, Zita Cobb was, was, a, was born on Fogo Island and left to pursue her education on the mainland. And um, when... Uh, and she did very well in uh, the high-tech sector. And she came back to Fogo Island in 2006 wanting to give back to her community. And so she started with some scholarship programs, giving money to students. And then one day, a mother came up to her and said, do you realize that you're actually paying our students, our, our young people to leave the island? And that's when she realized that although her philanthropy was in the right place, that she was actually fueling the problem about migration. And that caused her to really shift her thinking, and it really caused her to turn to social entrepreneurship as a means of reviving a community. And so together with her, two of her brothers, they founded the Shorefast Foundation. And the vision is to make Fogo Island more culture or more economically resilient, meaning economically stronger, creating jobs, but doing it in a way that also strengthens the culture and the society there. So not just focusing only on the business piece of it, but really that social piece in social entrepreneurship. And their mantra really is, uh, revolves around finding new ways with old things. And so not losing that connection to the past, because it would be, you know, there's lots of opportunities to bring business to an area, but for them it was really important to make sure that that business, whatever activities they engaged in, that they respected the past and really drew on uh, the past as an asset rather than a liability. And so an example of this would be the, um, the punts. And of course the punts were fading out of use, they weren't being used anymore, and the, those who knew how to build the punts, there were very few of them left on the island. And, and so the Shorefast Foundation decided, why not bring the tradition back, but find a new, a new use for punts. And the, the way that they did that was through the Fogo Island punt race, which you may have heard of, um, to there and back, to change islands and back. But they've now re kind of uh, changed things. Um, being entrepreneurial, they're always kind of, uh, whenever they face any kind of problems or challenges, they find new ways to, to, uh, to, use, uh, to use this, um, this punt race. And so I'll give you one very brief example. A couple of years ago, they realized they didn't have enough people on Fogo Island and Change Islands who wanted to row in the race, and so they had to cancel it. And then they decided, well, maybe this is a sign that we need to open it up to people from the rest of Newfoundland uh, to, to come and row in, in the race. And so they've been, you know, uh, really facing these challenges and finding new ways of approaching them and creative ways of approaching them. They've also been drawing on the past, drawing inspiration from local architecture in their design of the studios, as you can see in this photograph. And when I ask, you know, Zita, why art? Why would you use art? Because, of course, they're drawing a lot on geotourism, uh, you know, to bring people um, to create a new leg on the economy in addition to the, the, the fishery. But they also have been drawing a lot on art and bringing artists to uh, Fogo Island. And she says that it's because it really helps uh, it encourages this critical thinking that's important if you're going to avoid being culturally flattened. So if you really want to avoid losing your identity and your culture, you need to find, um, you know, you need to be, think critically about how your economic development is going to look like so that you don't lose your sense of self. And she feels like art is one of the ways that they can do that, bring these artists to the island. Um, and there's a, you know, a lot of the Shorefast's activities revolve around building a spirit or a culture of entrepreneurialism, because entrepreneurialism isn't just about 
starting a business. It's, it's about understanding, um, you know, how to, how to take risks and how to seek out opportunities where other people may not see those opportunities. And the way that they've done this is um, through, there's a number of initiatives on Fogo Island uh, that, are, um, that's, that are encouraging entrepreneurialism. One is a business assistance fund. It's like the micro lending example that I talked about earlier with Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank, uh, but, but on Fogo Island. So giving small loans to um, people who have business ideas, providing business coaching. As I mentioned earlier, bringing outsiders in uh, you know, not so many that the culture is, you know, un under threat, but, uh, you know, enough uh, outsiders to kind of bring in some new energy and new ideas. And, uh, and these outsiders come on to Fogo Island, and it's not a one-way, you know, they're not there, you know, the artists are not there to teach the Fogo Islanders um, about their own ways. They're there to learn about Fogo Island and how people... Um, how people on Fogo Island, uh, you know, what their traditions are, what their ways of knowing are. So it's very much a two-way uh, street. And then building on local assets. And I, I love this example because to most people, if you talk about weather in Newfoundland, it's always a very interesting conversation, especially uh, when the weather is, is not very good in the winter or the spring. Um, but what the Shorefast Foundation has done to attract people to Fogo Island um, in all the seasons, because of course, uh, you know, one of the big challenges in, with tourism in Newfoundland is that um, it's, it's a very short season and it's very difficult to make a go of it in, over a short period of time and, and having to close your doors for the rest of the winter. So what they've done is they've, they've um, They've decided to talk about Fogo Island seasons as being seven seasons, and they've drawn a lot of attention to the fact that it's an exciting place to go in the winter or when they have their ice season or when they have their berry picking season, and really trying to get people to get excited about the opportunity to go and experience all of those seasons. And when I was looking on TripAdvisor the other day to see what kind of reviews that the Fogo Island Inn is getting, because of course they opened their doors in May, uh, you had tourists saying, you know, this is the most beautiful place I've ever been to and it's wonderful and the inn is spectacular and blah, 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 and I can't wait to go back and experience one of their other seasons. And so this is a really good example of what entrepreneurialism is. It's being creative. It's seeing the opportunity where other people see problems or challenges. That's what entrepreneurialism is. And so they're leading by example. They're inspiring people to take those risks and to think differently about opportunities. And so the inn, of course, um, what's, what I find so fascinating about the inn, and I think it's, it's um, really a testament to the spirit of the Shorefast Foundation that their goal is to really engage with the community. It's not to build this big inn and to bring tourists in who will never interact or or get to know the community. It's about bringing the community into the inn and because this inn belongs to the community. It's built for the community and all the revenues go back into the community. And so what they've done, and, and I think it's extremely creative and wonderful, is that they've opened up the inn as a public space for the local community. Um, so anybody in the local community it can use the art gallery, the library, um, the cinema, and uh, it also gives them a chance to interact with the tourists. So you don't have this separation between tourists and community in the way that you might if you went to some Caribbean resort where you're on the resort but you're not really experiencing the place. This is about bringing people to Fogo Island to experience Fogo Island and the wonderful culture that exists there. And here's another example of a room in the inn where you see modern design Combining with, um, combined with traditional ways, like the, this beautiful quilt that was handmade in the community, or the chair that was built um, by craftspeople in the community, and carpenters. Again, modern design, you know, modern bathroom here with a, a touch of the island there, you know, some of the wood, some of the rocks, to remind people that when they're in this inn, they're on Fogo Island, that this Fogo Island inn is of this place. Um, 
And here are some examples of entrepreneurs. So here's Nicole from Nicole's Cafe who moved back to Fogo Island. Remember, the whole goal is to bring young people back and to keep young people on Fogo Island to, to, to have the, the kind of energy that you need in a community to, um, to, keep it, to keep it thriving and strong. And so Nicole started Nicole's Cafe, which um, is a wonderful restaurant if you're ever on Fogo Island. You should definitely check it out. There's also a, a daycare that was built, um, that started up about a year and a half ago. And as soon as they built it, they realized they had more demand than they thought. So they had to expand right away. Um, and having traveled to many parts of Newfoundland and rural communities in particular, I have never noticed, um, I hadn't noticed until that point that uh, you don't often see daycares in small rural places. So I thought that was really interesting. But there's always going to be a tension between these social and economic goals. And I'll just give you a couple examples of what that tension might look like. It might look like um, a tension between, you know, you want to bring tourists in, right? But maybe you don't want, for example, to bring too many. Because if, you, if you're overrun with tourists, well, this causes all kinds of problems. Like, for example, on Fogo Island, it causes problems with the ferry. The ferry, you know, uh, you get these long lineups at the ferry and uh, people get frustrated and the local population becomes resentful. And so what they did is they decided that they should keep the inn on a smaller scale but seek more affluent tourists. Because if you, if you have fewer tourists but you want to still generate enough of an economic return, then you need to start thinking about, okay, well maybe we want to draw more affluent tourists to the inn so that they're spending more money on the island. And, create, and they're therefore creating more spin-offs and more jobs. Um, creating guest experiences that capitalize on local assets. This is not easy to do, but they've found some, some ways of doing that um, where they can, again, combine, uh, the, have the visitors come, into, come onto the island and really experience the culture by getting the local people to, uh, to take the, the visitors around to show them what a cabin experience is in Newfoundland. Um, et cetera, et cetera, and I could, you know, I could tell you a lot of different examples, but in the interest of time, I'll just move on, and um, I really like this quote because it's really powerful that according to the laws of nature or the uncompromising realities of business, Fogo Island should be an uninhabited windswept footnote in Canadian history, an example of rurality retreating in an era of relentless urban centralization. But instead, I think the Shorefast, they're aspiring to, be, to transform Fogo and Change Islands into a world model for rural economic transformation. And let me be clear, I'm not suggesting that um, you know, other communities should do what Fogo Island is doing. What I'm, so I'm not as interested in what they're doing as in how they're doing it. I think that the lessons for other communities are in the how. And so here are some examples of, of some of the lessons that I I think might be useful to other communities. I think community champions are absolutely critical. And so it doesn't, so it's not just, what's going on on Fogo Island is not just about Zita Cobb. I mean, yes, people are drawn to her because of her story and all the media attention is about her, but there are so many people on Fogo Island who are community champions, who are giving this project all kinds of, of energy and passion and really driving these initiatives forth. Um, engaging the whole community. Um, this is absolutely critical. This, the, the Shorefast Foundation's work on Fogo Island will not work if the whole community is not engaged and if, if the majority of people are not supportive. And there will always be naysayers. And so, you know, make no mistake that this is not, um, you know, this hasn't been easy. Uh, with the work that they've done has been full of challenges. But by engaging the community, they've found ways around a lot of these challenges because what they've done is they've harnessed the creativity and the energy from the local communities. Thinking holistically is about thinking about the whole, the big picture and connecting the, the dots between the different initiatives. How do these different initiatives on Fogo Island, whether it's the punt race or the artist studios or the Nicole's Cafe or these businesses that are other businesses that are popping up, how do they all fit together? Because we tend to maybe think about, you know, the little piece that we focus on, but when we kind of step back and look at how all the pieces fit together, um, that's when 
I think that's when the magic can happen. And seeking sustainable community development. It's not just about economic community development. It's not just about creating jobs. It's about respecting the natural environment. It's about making sure that the culture is, in, is, is uh, made to be more resilient rather than flattened. It's finding a way to, 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 find, uh, to, to develop the community in a sustainable way, looking at all of those pieces together rather than separately. I think other lessons for um, rural communities include finding place-based solutions um, and really capitalizing on local assets. When you look around a community, there are all, all kinds of assets and there's all kinds of enthusiasm. So for example, yesterday evening we were lucky enough to get a tour of the Sunny Cottage and it was uh, Pansy who gave us the tour and I thought, wow, this person has so much passion for the history of this place, for the history of this Sunny Cottage. She was a wealth of knowledge and she made that experience, that tour of the Sunny Cottage so special for us because of all of her, of her knowledge of the place. Um, and also, I think it's important to remember that you kind of need a, a vision and some long-term goals because a lot of these things don't happen overnight. And, um, and when you take a long-term view of things, then your, your view of all of these initiatives somehow changes and you start to see connections between things that you otherwise might not see. And you also start to build this hope for the future. When you look far enough into the future and you think about what do we want this community to look like in 10, 20, 30 years, you really start to make decisions differently when you take a long-term view. And so I think that's really important. But you can't ignore the short-term needs and the short, you know, there are always going to be urgent things coming up that need to be addressed. So it's, it's a question of balancing the, your short-term goals and your long-term goals. Working through tensions, I think this is a really critical one. I think there's always going to be adversity and many challenges in all of this and many tensions between opposite forces at play. And it could be different members of the community having very different priorities. That's always going to be the case. But where you can really um, you know, work th if you can work through these tensions um, and not see them as a, as a threat, but rather as an opportunity, I think that's where the, you can harness the creative energy in these tensions and find ways through them rather than ignoring them. And I think it's human nature to ignore tensions, but um, it, when, when you're trying to revive a community, you're, you're just going to, going to have to face these tensions head on. And then finally, building an entrepreneurial culture. I think social entrepreneurship is not just about creating social value, but it's really about doing it in entrepreneurial ways, in ways that harness creativity, that look for opportunities, like I said, where others see problems or challenges, and, um, and finding ways to, to, um, uh, to, to collect or, or, or discover resources that you may not otherwise have thought about and collecting all of those resources, bringing all of these resources together, whether it's your you know, social you know, capital, your, your people, whether it's financial resources, it's being creative about how you find resources and how you use those resources. So I'm gonna stop right there and I look forward to your questions after when we have the panel. So thank you very much. I really enjoyed Natalie's uh, presentation. It's, uh, it's always great to uh, be able to hear a story where somebody has a few minutes to kind of delve into it a little bit. Uh, I know there was an awful lot that Natalie might have said but couldn't say, and it's been a challenge for all of us working on this panel, how we're going to say everything that we'd like to in the, in the time frame. Uh, just to get me started, I'd like to say thank you as well to the Harris Center for uh, including me in this session, CSC, the Community Sector Council of Newfoundland and Labrador, the organization that I work with, has been on the track of trying to talk about social enterprise now going back to 2005, 2006. In fact, it goes further back than that, but using this language, we actually go back to 2006. And a lot of what we've been trying to do is to get people 
understanding the language to some extent, but also working as well as we can with governments to try to get their thinking to move a little bit away from typical funding programs. So what I want to do today is walk through some of the drier pieces that relate to social enterprise. It's kind of interesting, Natalie, who's the professor, did the community story, <laughs> and now I'm going to be more like the professor, so uh, maybe we're learning to, uh, to share and, and uh, do things in, in different ways. Just one quick point I'd like to correct, Mike. Uh, you said we were based in St. John's. I'd just like people to know we also have an office in Bonavista and an office in Gander, uh, and we have had one in Bjorn. So uh, we are out and about, as they say, doing different pieces of work. If you look on this slide, you'll see the cover of a report we produced in 2007 called Community Profits, Social Enterprise in Newfoundland and Labrador. You can find it on our website, but it was our first effort to get a grip on organizations in the province that were actually trying to function in some way as social enterprises. Uh, that work clearly needs to be updated now. So what I'm going to spend my 15 minutes at today is talking about community and social enterprise as a model and how we can use this model for organizational community and regional development. Just very quickly a word about the Community Sector Council. We are a registered charity, so we're a nonprofit. And part of the main work that we do is working with the nonprofit sector, trying to advance the concept of what happens at the community level in the community sector, and to also influence public policies. So this is a really important piece of what I want to talk about as we get through this today. So let's come back to the concept and the language social enterprise. And you'll hear me sometimes referring to community enterprise because I think that's really nice language as well. I've already said I'm embedded in the nonprofit sector. So to me, social enterprises are business, businesses which are owned by nonprofit organizations that are directly involved in the production and or selling of goods and services for the blended purpose of generating income and achieving social, cultural, or environmental goals. If you're a nonprofit organization, it's just one more tool that we will all use uh, for the benefit of our communities. And as everybody has said, and this is the key element here, it's what distinguishes what happens in a social enterprise in the nonprofit world from a private sector business. Any surpluses that are generated go back into the organization's mission or into community goals rather than as a profit for an individual. Definitions are hard. Whenever you start to do any homework on social enterprise, you'll learn immediately that there is no single definition. But there are certainly some defining characteristics. And just to highlight some of these characteristics, to operate a social enterprise, it has to be citizen-led. It has to be community-based. There's no other way of doing it. It's a way of bringing people, organizations, communities, and regions together to meet common objectives. Social enterprises exist, in my book, outside of the public sector and outside of the private sector. So they vest themselves in the community sector. They are independent organizations, and therefore they're accountable to a defined constituency, to their board of directors, or to the wider community where they're working, as opposed to a government department, or to their shareholders. Now, don't get too confused here, but I've told you I work in the nonprofit community sector. So this is actually very simple. What I've done in inner circle is just define those organizations in my mind which form the nonprofit community sector. So the ones I'm interested in today are the ones in the pale yellow, the co-ops, registered nonprofits, and charities, because they are the three forms of structures that we work with at a community level. Social enterprise is a particular form within that context. So it could be a co-op, it could be a registered charity, or it could be a registered nonprofit. The distinguishing feature, as I've said before, 
is the fact that the social enterprise is generating revenue. It's a market transaction, as others have said. These are the only legal forms we can use at the moment. If you want to start a social enterprise, you have to get registered under one of those forms. There is some debate as to whether there should be a separate form for social enterprise, but by and large, it's not the biggest debate we need to have in the social enterprise world at the moment. So let's just talk a little bit about what's earned revenue, because that's what distinguishes a social enterprise from other forms of nonprofits. So it's about selling goods and services. It could be contracts or third-party pay for the service you're rendering. It could be a trade that you're doing with the typical marketplace where you have customers. To be a social enterprise, in my book, you would not have to be 100% fully funded by earned revenue traded in the marketplace. You can get your money from a number of different sources. What earned income is not, okay, because I think this helps us understand it. It's not about ongoing government funding by way of grants and make work projects or job creation subsidies. It's not in-kind donations, so that's very important. And it's not donations from individuals, and it's really not just another fundraising strategy. If you're going to embark on a social enterprise, you need to have your head in a very different space. You need to be in that entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial space, which Natalie has referred to, where you think we've got something to sell, we've got something to market, and that is what's going to make our social enterprise successful. So there, a lot of people will say, well, this isn't social enterprise just another term for what we've already been doing? And in many ways, that's true. I mean, if you think of Salvation Army thrift shops, they bring clothing, they sell it, they make money, they put the money back into the services they're delivering. If you think of gift shops and hospitals, you've got a group of women, usually, volunteers, raising a lot of money, pumping that money back into the hospital. They're selling things for the better good. It could be a Legion Hall, it could be a Lion's Club. Right? Lion's Club probably rents out their facilities. They make money to keep this facility alive, which is then for community benefit. Some of the newer organizations that are around that we don't have time to talk about today, but that would be very interesting when you as a community start to move forward, is to think about what's going on in St. Anthony, in a place called Sabri. And if we have time, I can come back and talk about that. Rising Tide, Tide Theater in Trinity earns more than 50% of its revenue from ticket sales and sales of products. That organization has been keeping that peninsula active and vital and attracting other things here. So they're having benefit way beyond just the theater that they're producing. And then you have groups like NITCO, which is a film co-op. So it's a group of people who come together as a co-op that earn money to do the work that they want to do to produce films. And then you have organizations like the Community Sector Council where we don't, the only product we sell is ourselves. We sell our services, we sell our training, we sell the work that our staff and employees and volunteers can do uh, to, to generate revenue for our organization. I think the big point I really want to make here is that the models around social enterprise are not yet very well known. We all need to start understanding a lot more how we structure these organizations and how we can develop them for the good of our community. So if you want to think about social enterprise as a model, there are probably a number of reasons why you would want to go down this path, because I should just say social enterprise is not an easy path to go down. Natalie has said it's long term, even though you have short term uh, opportunities and issues you have to deal with, you're not going to get a social enterprise up and running very often in the short term. So when you're thinking about this approach, you have to think why you want to do it. Is it around community revitalization? Is it to stimulate job creation? Perhaps it's about creating job experience for people who are not yet ready to go into the normal workforce. And that's a very important part of some of the social enterprises we hear about. And one that we hear about quite often is the Hungry Heart Cafe in St. John's. And what they do is employ people who have significant issues which make it quite difficult for them to move directly into the regular workplace. So it could be about having a small cafe, or it could be something large and expansive, like what's going on in Fogo Island, and everything in between. And in the nonprofit world, 
This could be about using contracts and money from lots of sources to do the work you want to do, but ultimately you have to be earning this revenue which distinguishes you from a typical charity or from a typical nonprofit. One of the things that's really important, I, in my mind, where there's a tremendous advantage for, um, for uh, social enterprise, is that we often hear, particularly in rural communities, about somebody who's had their own little business. The family doesn't want to take that business over, so they close the business. Well, we're getting smarter now. What's happening is nonprofits are starting to take over some of these businesses. And they can take them and run them and employ people and make money to put back into social causes in the community. So I think there's a real sleeper here, and that is how we connect businesses that are you know, teetering, family-owned private businesses, or in some cases big businesses that don't think the profit margin that they're making is good enough. Uh, you could be a social enterprise because you don't need your profit mar margin to be as big. You're not having to satisfy your shareholders. What you're trying to do is create employment, create social value, and have enough money in your pocket to run your organization, and if you've got any surpluses, it's money you can put back into your community. So let's just think about what I've been saying. We've been talking a bit about having to have this financial return so you're making money, and we've been talking about the social benefits. So this is just way, one way of trying to conceptualize what a social enterprise is. Obviously, you have to have a, an investment and you have to have a return on that investment. On the one hand, you want your social return for the community benefit or the benefit of your clients, and you have to have your financial return. But at the end of the day, what the social enterprise is all about is this blended value return on investment, where you're getting both your social and your uh, financial return. And that's what motivates you to be doing the work that you're doing and to be willing to find a way of selling what you're doing. There are a whole variety of different models. Uh, and I'm not going to belabor this point very much, but. You can be strictly a fee-for-service, or you can be a service subsidization model. You can be a model where your primary goal is to create employment, or you can be a combined model, I and mean, you can bring in all different elements in how you set up your social enterprise. I think there's some really key areas in Newfoundland, where Labrador, where we can find some subsector opportunities. Health and social services, we haven't even scratched the surface of how social enterprises could be delivering health and social services. I think we're much more familiar with the tourism and the arts and culture and heritage kind of social enterprises. So let's just summarize where I am at this point. What are some of the strategic advantages for social enterprises? Well, very often they can go where private business may not go or may not want to go. Because they expect less profit than private business. Another advantage is that the profits stay in the community. They're not going out to shareholders who are scattered in areas away from where we're working. Another really good advantage to me of a social enterprise is that you can't get this off the ground unless you have the collective commitment of a lot of people. And it's also a really good way to mobilize both disadvantaged regions and people who are vulnerable. It's a way of integrating them into the world of work and into what's going on in their community. And if there's a kind of a side benefit here uh, that people talk about is that sometimes when you get people learning to be entrepreneurial within the nonprofit sector and in social enterprise world, they become more entrepreneurial and think about other things that can be going on in their community. And I think that's what we heard in the Fogo Island experience, that there are some small businesses that are being generated as a result of the social enterprise work that's being done there. Okay, can you bear it? <laughs> if you want to start a social enterprise, there are a number of steps and processes that you need to take. So if you, I don't have a pointer, I don't think, but if you start up here, what do we do when we come before a committee? Huh? And everybody gets together and they talk about what they want to do. So let's say you're gonna form your enterprise committee because you want to get something going. Well, then you have to do a little bit of assessment about whether you've got an organization that's even ready to embark on this kind of undertaking, because it's not for the weak at heart. Social enterprise is hard work. It's probably harder work than running a charity or a nonprofit where you expect everybody just to fund what you're doing. 
This is you trying to make this happen for yourself. So you have to do some market research, of course. What kind of a social enterprise fits with your community, fits with your culture, fits in the world that you want to work in? And then perhaps you need to spend some time identifying and screening those opportunities. <coughs> you need to go back and retest what you're thinking about. Then, of course, you got to do your feasibility study. Is there anybody out there who's going to have the slightest interest in what you're going to do? Because there's huge risk attached to this. I mean, it's risk of the individuals involved, and you've had to get your startup money from somewhere, so there's always risk. But you're trying to mitigate your, ri your risk as you move forward. So, obviously, you have to do a business plan. And if your business plan and feasibility plan don't look like you're on the right track, then maybe you'd want to reconsider whether you're going to proceed. And obviously, part of what you have to do is get ready to implement and review and refine, review and refine, review and refine every way you go. So there are a number of key factors for success, and I'm about to wrap up now. Um, but you have to have a documented need. You certainly have to have an entrepreneurial culture. Entrepreneurism is not for everybody. I think we've become quite complacent very often in assuming government's going to give us money, government's going to tell us how to do it, government's going to give us money to hire people. But this is about getting, taking charge ourselves and engaging uh, in a new way of doing our work. Uh, but you also have to have a critical mass to purchase whatever it is that you're developing. And my story is I could have the best dry cleaning plant in the world in Harbour Breton, but if nobody wants to get his pants cleaned, I'm not going to succeed. So the fact of the matter is you have to know that what you're going to sell is going to be able to attract the business. Otherwise, you're going to fold like you would in any other business. Really important, you've got to have access for startup capital. If you don't have capital, and if you don't have somebody or somewhere where you can get that capital, you're going to fall flat on your face pretty damn fast, in my view. So what's really all about? I was really all about thinking big, thinking bold, and finding ways how together we can create possibilities. Do I have another minute? One minute. One. Okay. So I want to now just come back to this business of how we actually position social enterprise and what we actually require to make this more of a culture and more of a, a direction we can move in collectively across the province. And I mentioned at the beginning that one of the things that the Community Sector Council does is promote public policy. So in 2011, prior to the last election, along with a group of people who we convene on a regular basis from across the province who are pretty reflective about what's going on out and about, one of the recommendations we made to all political parties was that they should encourage approaches to support and strengthen social and community enterprise activity Encourage, and encourage a greater understanding of the model as a legitimate means for development. And we also had uh, similar recommendations around investment funds and the need to do research. Anyway, the good news was, in the provincial government's blue book, they picked up this recommendation, as you can see, word perfect. So they've committed themselves now to looking at the social enterprise model and looking to see what can be done to help us all get through this process. CSC has been shopping this idea a lot with our political colleagues and with the bureaucracy. And this is basically the direction that we say we need to be going in from a government perspective so it can be supportive to what we want to do in communities. First of all, there need to be strategic investments to seed innovation through research and development as well as supporting existing social enterprises. We need better practitioner skills, and that's backed up by research. We need access to capital. We need tools to demonstrate the value of what we're doing. We need to encourage greater market opportunities through procurement policies and community benefit agreements. We need to find ways to create networking, uh, as Harris Center is doing today among stakeholders and regional resources. And we obviously <laughs> need an enabling policy environment and a policy and program framework that will enable some of this to happen. And I'm just going to close by saying Newfoundland is way behind what's happening in other parts of the world and in other provinces in terms of our lack of a policy framework and in our lack of having this kind of cohesive movement, which is what's taking place across the country 
and across the world. And there are a number of uh, interesting organizations that I can talk about uh, when I come back, like the Social Economy Council of Canada and the Atlantic Council for Community and Social Enterprise. And there's just been a massive world forum in Calgary where over a thousand of us got together to talk about these issues. So this is a movement that's getting rooted. What we need to do is get the bold idea out and then find all the little legs we need to make this happen in our province. Thanks. Uh, just to set the context, I guess, for me, um, I am originally from Harbour Branton itself, and I have made my home uh, in St. Albans, actually. That's where my family lives right now. And I moved back in 1996, and I've been very, very fortunate to actually uh, keep employment with myself here in this region. I've only had to move away for about three months, and um, I've been very, very fortunate as a resident from Costa Bay to actually be employed here, and I really, really enjoy what I do. But today, um, I'm just going to talk about one of, the org one of the organizations I'm involved with. When I moved back uh, in St. Albans, um, I got really involved in the community and have been a real advocate for certain areas, and one of them is youth. Uh, a few years ago, I did get the uh, Beta Spear area engaged into developing a community youth network. We started from scratch and it's a very, very successful uh, operation right now. We finally got status from the province. And so I kind of walked away from that, but one of the committees that I got involved in in 1998, it was, uh, was the Recreation Committee. And being a very athletic individual all my youth at, uh, is something that I still had a passion for. And I had no kids at that time. So I did get on this committee back in 1998. And starting off, um, I guess we could see there were some issues around some sustainability issues and uh, some of the areas that we wanted to focus on and areas that we knew we need to focus on. So I kind of jumped right in there and got involved. Um, Sometimes I've uh, wondered why I did it, but uh, lots of times you feel like you want to throw things down, but you look at what your purpose is and you do have uh, lots of things to offer uh, for the community. So just to give you a brief uh, history, uh, the St. Albans Recreation has existed actually since the six, uh, 1960s. Our mandate has been to provide recreational activities and infrastructure for all residents. And yes, we are located, our committee operates at St. Albans, but we do provide a lot of our services and programs throughout all the Bay Spirit area and also Con River through our uh, winter programming that we do have there. And we are a nonprofit incorporated uh, organization through the province. But over the years, you'll see a big list here of infrastructure, because it seemed like way back when, you know, St. Albans itself used to have three schools. There was 12 and 1,300 kids going to school. So you can imagine the types of infrastructure over the years that they were able to build upon. And some of these are listed here, outdoor arena. We now have an indoor arena. And I'm going to talk about how that came about. Uh, softball fields have existed, soccer fields, used to be a game center, an outdoor swimming pool, which no longer exists. Uh, playgrounds, there's been two or three playgrounds built over the years and we now have actually one that's a phenomenal uh, place for our kids and is used extensively. Uh, we now are engaged in tennis and basketball courts and we had a skateboard park. And I'll get into a little bit about that skateboard park we got rid of. And we've learned a lot of things. Um, we've listened to the youth, we've listened to parents on things that they would like to see in the community. And we tried a lot of different things. There are things that did not work for different reasons. So we said, we're not going to spend our time on those things anymore if they're not profitable, or if it's not being used, or if it's being vandalized. We, we cut it off right away. So over the years, uh, this is how we've become a community social enterprise. And I'm really glad some of the things, Penny, that you have said, and also Natalie, because it really enforces it for us uh, how we do things uh, with our committee. So back in 1996, uh, there was a steel structure that was placed over the outdoor arena. Uh, there used to be a, a big facility there, and every year you didn't know if you were going to be playing ice hockey. We used the bay, basically, for pretty much all the ice hockey. We've had a lot of great hockey players uh, throughout Bay Despair, and even the whole Coast Bay's region. And so the town actually took upon themselves to obtain a loan uh, through the federal provincial loan programs and so on that they used to have to put a steel structure over the building. 
However, we still had the issue of how do we make ice? How are we going to offer our winter programming? We didn't have an ice system. We had to depend on the weather to make that operation uh, or that facility operational. Uh, the way it was designed was kind of backwards because of the big door structure and we were depending on the, the cool air from the bog. Those, most of you don't know where St. Albans probably is or the location of our facilities. So that caused some issues for us. It was very frustrating that we were not guaranteed that we could make ice. So we could not provide that service to our people. So we, we looked at some different things there depending on the weather, additional expenses from an outdoor to an indoor. We had a committee, uh, heat and light, we needed staff, we needed a Zamboni, uh, and we had loan payments. The town, thank God, they took like loan payments and so on. Uh, we had to pay for heat and light. We had to pay for staff. And the Zamboni actually was a man-made little concoction that the person had to actually haul around to clear the ice. So that's how we started. So these are the two questions that we were faced with way back in 1996. Now, I wasn't there in 1996. That's when I moved back here. Um, how do we manage such a building if we cannot guarantee the ice? Now, the arena is just one piece of infrastructure that we manage. The other question is, how do we maintain the other infrastructure? Uh, it's a small group, um, lots of facilities around. We had soccer fields, softball fields, those kinds of things, playgrounds, and we wanted to put many more things in place. So when we started, or at least when I started at 1998, these were the issues. Ice making, staff, loan payments, additional dressing rooms, seating, hospitality room, and maintaining other infrastructure. And this is how we've dealt with it, and we continue to thrive very, very well. Our Zamboni, uh, to make life much easier for our staff, uh, we had some wonderful friends in Ottawa uh, who knew of a Zamboni that was stored in someone's garage. <laughs> And they made a few contacts, so we got that for 1200 bucks. And it was the Lions Club in St. Albans who actually purchased it for us. Uh, the Lioness, the Leo purchased, uh, as between the three of them, they paid for the logos and the shipping. We didn't pay anything. And that Zamboni was used for about 12 years, so we got best bang for our buck, for sure. And we were very, very fortunate to have Newfoundland Labrador Hydro at our back door, who used to take the uh, Zamboni at their facility and basically take it apart, clean it up, make sure it was still good for us to use for the next number of years. However, we've moved beyond that as well. Um, we've applied to the federal and provincial government for funding for an eco ice system. Because we couldn't guarantee our ice, we weren't too sure if the traditional artificial ice system would work for us economically because we knew that there were a lot of arenas on the island who were struggling uh, with you know, making payments and those things and everything else. So we did some research, ran an eco ice system. It's from Quebec and it operates uh, much cheaper than the traditional one, so it saves us a lot of money. Um, so the town council actually applied for that and um, we did some different scenarios and so on. So that's in place. Uh, dressing rooms, JCP project. Uh, anybody who knows me, I'm always chasing little bits of pots of money wherever we can put little pieces in place. So we were able to do that. Um, we also had some individuals in the community who approached us about the NHL Players Association. And uh, they knew that they had some money for recreational activities. So we were very successful in obtaining $80,000 to put in new boards of glass. Because when the steel structure was put over our facility, uh, we still had the old boards and so on and the glass that was outside for many, many years. So that was really difficult. And um, also, I didn't say that we needed a new floor system as well. That came along with the eco system. And the seating around the arena, we had no seats, really. It was just boards and stuff like that. And a lot of arenas still got that. So we're proud to say that uh, we actually got the old seats from the old Mall One Stadium in St. John's. 
for next to nothing. Uh, then uh, the hospitality upstairs uh, was completed through JCP project and a loan with the bank. One of the things that uh, our committee has seen is that with all the revenue that we do generate, there are sometimes uh, situations where we have to go somewhere else to look for the money we want to complete it. Uh, we don't start a project unless we know we can get it completed. So with this situation, um, when we did our budget, uh, the electrical piece uh, came in way, way above. So we had to get uh, a $20,000 loan uh, from the bank, basically. And through the uh, support from our town council, um, you know, we were able to do that and that's all paid off. So we have a fabulous hospitality upstairs now in the arena and we're very, very proud of that. And the way that our committee is structured, uh, we are actually an arm of our town council in St. Albans. We report directly to them. Um, you know, our finances, all of our reports go to them. They support us tremendously. We can't do this without our town council. Uh, we agree that we pay our light bill. We pay all of our maintenance. Our town actually supports us through their insurance policy, so you can imagine we have public facilities, uh, the liability issues and so on, so the town has agreed to, they cover that. And what we found a few years ago uh, was when we started, we used to pay for staff, and we used to pay uh, our, the loan payments, those kinds of things. And we found that it was draining every penny that we had. We could not see us putting extra facilities in place, having a better arena that we can offer more programming. We just, we just didn't have the money to do it because we had to pay for all these extra things. So we did sit down with our uh, town council way back when. They agreed that they would take over uh, the loan payments and our staff. They take care of two staff people every year for us. So we're able to save thousands and thousands of dollars from staffing and we're able to reinvest all that back into the arena and other facilities that we operate with. So it's worked very, very well. And we're very fortunate to have um, a council um, so supportive of us. I'm just jumping into a few things. So with, of course, all this happening, we ended up having more issues. We have a huge, not a huge light bill compared to some arenas, but it's about $5,000. Even though we have hydro at our back door, we don't get a break, trust me. <laughs> but they are still really, really supportive of us as well in other ways. Uh, the loan payments, we needed more staff, and again, the council, they took care of all that. And the staff wages took a toll on us, and um, we didn't have a lot of money to work with at the end. And then we knew our $1,200 Zamboni was eventually going to give out. So we made some long-term plans uh, right back then, and every year when we used to send our letter into council, that's a process we set. Every December we used to write the council and say, okay, this is what we need for the next year. So because we made sure that they had their budget done, you know, for items that we would possibly need. And the Zamboni was always one. And I'm very, very proud to say that uh, back in 2012, uh, once we got it back from Hydro, the old one, they kept saying, hmm, not too sure how many more years you're going to get out of this thing. So we started a campaign for our Zamboni, and I'm very proud to say that we raised $105,000 in about nine months. And uh, we kept our own little pot of money. We put our own 20 grand in. We had the council. We got a corporate sponsor for 10 years. Uh, we had all the community support. We wrote mass right across the island, and um, then what we did was uh, we were short 25000 So because of the uh, past experience we had with our bank, uh, we were able to get a loan from the bank of $25,000. So we're actually paying that, like less than five bucks, uh, five, which was five bucks, $500 a month. And we already got a plan for the next piece of infrastructure. So this is... I tried to capture how we make it work for us. There's two main areas, and one is our revenue generation, obviously, as Penny was saying. We do access funding through various sources, uh, both you know federal and provincial. Uh, I'm always applying for different little pots of money. But we don't apply for money to cover off the normal operation costs of 
running our facilities. We also have a soccer field. We just partnered with the Moms for Play for the playgrounds, those kinds of things. Uh, when we apply for money, it's very specific projects or pieces of infrastructure um, because we generate tons of money throughout the year with a, a great profit uh, through different things that's listed here. So when we do apply, we always got a project that's in mind. So it doesn't, it doesn't cost us 100% of the funds all the time out of our pots. So we have different summer dances. We've learned a lot of things from summer dances, what to do, what not to do, to cut cost. Uh, we do have our service, of course, is, um, and our programs is our rental fees. We have different activities. Here. We review our fee structure every three years because with the increased cost of certain items, uh, we have to do that. And there's one thing that we are trying to instill in people in Beta Spare is you want all this and we're willing to help and do whatever we can, but there's a cost to things. And these costs are going up. Uh, but we haven't actually been able, haven't had to increase our fees uh, in about four years. So we're doing quite, quite well. We do different things like ticket sales, hockey pools, uh, when we first started, uh, we had to build two more dressing rooms. We actually did a adopt a brick campaign. Uh, everybody actually owns a brick that's inside our arena, and the list is all up there. So we got money to do those things. We do hockey tournaments, TV bingo, uh, great uh, opportunity for fundraising. Uh, we can't do that without volunteer students. We have students every week who volunteer two hours. And in return, we try to offer them a job in a summer employment program. So we kind of try to give back to some of our supports as well. Uh, community birthday calendar, an awesome fundraiser. Uh, we are actually in our 25th year this year of that. That brings in some great uh, fundraising as well. And the only way that we make this work in St. Albans is the partnerships. If you cannot develop those types of partnerships and a trust, it's really, really difficult. And our partners uh, over the years has been our town council. The community support is phenomenal right throughout Beta Spirit and Con River. Uh, the business community, when I'm coming with a piece of paper, they know I'm looking for something. <laughs> so, you know, and they're, they're fabulous. No matter what you're looking for, if it's five bucks or a hundred bucks, it helps everybody in every way. The federal and provincial departments, um, I work really closely with a lot of them. It's a lot of work when you're applying for funds and you get uh, programs, you got documents to send back and like I'd say I probably give up at least an hour every single day to this committee alone. Um, I handle all the finances, those kinds of things and there's lots of strict controls that we have in place for that. Volunteers. Uh, these types of things cannot happen uh, without them. One of the great things, some of our programming that we've done is uh, food and fun camps. We partner with the RCMP, uh, with the Central Wellness, with Central Health. Um, one of the, the things that we've seen in the last number of years and the stats have shown our youth uh, stats, is, oh, I got zero minutes. Um, I knew I should talk faster. Uh, but what we've seen with our youth, of course, is the change in the physical activity and so on. We, we, we don't have kids involved in physical activity. We're supposed to be doing it in schools, and we're not seeing as much of that in schools. And the commitments aren't just there, so, and the healthy eating. The Central has the highest rate of uh, diabetes and obese children. So. We are trying to find ways to uh, get our youth involved. We do this through the food and fun camps. And we have Sandra Donnelly is here with Central Health, and she's very involved with that, and we partner with people like that. Uh, our CYN, our FET, they're wonderful. Um, we've got different partnerships that we're doing with them now. So it decreases our cost at our arena during the summer months. We actually go through the CYN and deliver some of our programs and services there. We don't want to lose that. So we're, we're partnering all around. Uh, our sports programs, our winter carnivals, we've got tons and tons of activity throughout the year, all year round. So for me and my committee, it's success for us is partnerships and accountability. We've built all these partnerships, and uh, there's a lot of stuff I haven't said here today because I could probably go on for a long time uh, with all the different things we have done, but there are some people here from St. Albans who know a lot of the work that's been being done there and with our committee. 
And the accountability part is very, very important as well. Uh, we are accountable to our town council at the end of the day with our finances and, and th things like that. But we're also accountable to all the organizations and the businesses that support us. Uh, one of the things that we always try to do is provide uh, those who give us some supports, whether it's funding or manpower like Hydro, is to ensure that they get a bit of publicity as well out in the community. For instance, when we did the New Zamboni uh, campaign, one of the little things we did was we offered advertising uh, at the arena for the next 10 years. And uh, so actually that's being in process now. We're getting the big thing done. And everybody who's donated to that will actually get some free advertising at the arena. So it's a bit of a bonus there. So there's lots of other things I could talk about and um, you know, and how we do certain things. And we, we can have a discussion later to, to do some of that. Sorry I'm gone over time. No, it's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, put up your hand. I'll keep track if we have lots of hands going up. And ask a question or make a comment. And with the combination of knowledge and experience on the panel, you couldn't get better on planet Earth than this combination here. So, any comments, questions, thoughts on what you've heard so far about social enterprise? Yes, over here. I don't necessarily have a question, but I certainly thank you for your input. And uh, as uh, all three of you were speaking, I'm thinking, wow, like uh, everything's just clicking in my mind of how much uh, the Harbor Breton Community Youth Network in so many different ways uh, is engaging in social enterprise. Uh, we were actually profiled by the Community Sector Council, Penny, a few years back, if you remember, yeah. as uh, a kind of like a role model, uh, innovative nonprofit organization. And just to give you a little bit, of, I guess, about what we do and uh, how we engaged in social enterprise, I guess we could say, um, as a nonprofit organization, we kind of got our feet wet back in 2008. What had happened at that time was um, we partnered with Primary Health Care uh, to uh, distribute a needs assessment in the community. Uh, that was distributed among both our seniors and our youth population to, uh, I guess, uh, identify any kind of needs or services that uh, could be provided in the community. So from that needs assessment, uh, the results gave us uh, the indication that we needed to provide some more support services for our seniors in the community in particular, uh, seeing that we already had, of course, a very active community youth network. Uh, a while before, prior to that, I think it was back in 2006, we had partnered with uh, the Seniors Resource Center in St. John's to offer more than a year-long program for seniors in our community. So in that sense, we had already began the process of uh, intergenerational learning for our youth. With that program became a very close connection with the senior population for the walk program. We taught them computers. Uh, for the first time, we had um, seniors in our community, like 80 plus, that were using email. And in fact, um, Instructing that with the seniors was very inspirational because I can remember to this day uh, they, when they set up their email accounts, they were singing out to each other across the room like, you know, did you get my email and so on and, and quite very excited to be even on Sears Outlet site, for example, to, to purchase things. So anyway, because we had already had that connection, we figured, wow, this is a great partnership for the Community Youth Network now to engage with the seniors once again. So we had applied for funding and was very successful in receiving a $25,000 grant from uh, Seniors Horizons program. So it went from there and we had consultations and meetings with the uh, Funship 50 Plus Club in the community and so on and decided, well, let's open a, an internet cafe. So once again, we carried out our mandate with intergenerational learning. Um, the process began and we were very successful in 2009 to open up the internet cafe. Here at Harper Rents, it was the very first uh, of its kind, uh, very much uh, unprecedented for a nonprofit organization and the partnerships, of course, to offer this kind of service to the community. And of course, as Gail pointed out, and Penny and Natalie, uh, there's many challenges connected with that. We were very successful from 2009 to 2011. But because of number of challenges, staffing issues, uh, not enough profit being generated to support staff without some other kinds of programs like JCPs and so on. 
uh, members of our 50 plus club were like 80 plus became exhausted with volunteering and unfortunately it had to fold. But anyway, it was a very successful venture in that uh, we were, um, I guess, for the first time introduced social enterprise in our community. And um, while this was all going on, <laughs> the CY was also offered uh, by Central Health to engage in another opportunity. And that was to undertake um, a daycare center in our community. And stepping once again outside of our mandate, which is of course to serve children or youth rather grade seven to 18 years of age, we saw another opportunity and a need in our community. We became the license holder for a daycare center and uh, we are the only community youth network in the province that is the license holder for such. And that has been extremely successful since 2008. So much so that we just got approved uh, more, uh, very, uh, only a few months ago for more than $78,000 to expand on that business. Um, more recently, we've you undertaken a new project. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so much to share, like Gail, I guess. And uh, so anyway, our, our more, most recent uh, activity will be trying to negotiate now a contract with Eastlink to uh, become the new operator of our community channel, which will be the first hybrid channel in uh, the province of its kind to offer um, a community channel type thing, interviews covering local activities, as well as an ad channel. And that it will be a marriage of a program we already had, thanks to Innovation of Rural Business and Development, uh, our HBTV program, and Crown Enterprises, which will be no more, which will be the community channel. So we've been a very active social enterprise in our community since 2008. I thought I'd share that with you. It's the Harbor Breton Community Youth Network. Fantastic. Any comments, questions from the panel, or responses <laughs> on that one? Just uh, your, your comment about how you suddenly found yourself without resources and therefore had to close. I guess that speaks a little bit to the challenge of being dependent on grants and money from other sources so that you know, if you have something that you can buy and sell over time, you can build your own business plan that one would hope uh, would make that kind of decision not necessary. Yeah. But uh, for our, in our particular case, of course, uh, the challenge was trying to build a roster of volunteers to maintain that, and we were unsuccessful in that venture, which yeah. led to us folding. Yeah. Well, great uh, point and great illustration of that challenge. I think we had a couple of hands from that table. Yes, yeah. my name is Alex Hickey. Uh, I run a consulting business out of St. Jacks and St. John's, and it's great to be here. And thank you very much, panels. You're uh, very informative and enlightening in many ways. Uh, we're all familiar with. Uh, social funding and social programs, uh, funding sources for social programming kinds of things like we just heard here and that's great. I'm interested in the aspect of your talk about entrepreneurship and business development. And Natalie, you made a point that you have to have champions to, uh, to make this work. And I think, Penny, you, you reinforced that. And we saw the example of Zeta Club and the example of the gentleman who started up eBay. The question is, where do these champions get funded? How do you support a champion for social enterprise business development at the same time as make a living if you're not financially independent? And are public and private funding agencies uh, positive in their outlook on investing in social enterprise? Great uh, question. Penny, go first on that one. I just wanted to respond to that. One of the things that uh, I know from meeting with colleagues across the country is that perhaps one of the reasons why we're lagging a little bit in this province is because we don't have uh, what might be described as private venture capitalists, people who are willing to put money into these kinds of undertakings where they're willing to allow that capital to be very patient, <laughs> extremely patient. Uh, and so that's a challenge for us. So a lot of the work that we still do in this province is definitely directed toward trying to get that kind of investment from governments. But that's a huge challenge. I mean, obviously, the uh, Fogo Island example, which I'll let Natalie speak to, is a very unusual situation. And it's a situation that's not going to obtain for many of us in our own community. So you've got the champion doesn't have to be somebody who's putting money in. The champion can be somebody with the idea who can go after these multiple sources, as Gail mentioned. But you, in my book, for example, when I look at the Community Sector Council, there's a lot we do that is dependent on 
money for specific undertakings, for specific programs that we get from specific sources. When we want to be socially enterprising, then we try to develop a product we can sell. And there's just one point I'd like to make here that I think there's a huge distinction as we're trying to move our way through this process between social enterprise as a noun and social enterprise as a verb. If you think of it as a noun, you think of it as an organization, as a structure. If you think of social enterprise as a verb, then what you're doing is changing the way in which you do business and think about things. Really great distinction. Uh, Natalie or Gail? Chung? Sure, yeah. I, I'd like to add um, that um, I don't necessarily think that community champions have to be uh, you know, paid to do that work of um, business coaching. I think that there's an opportunity to find people who are retired in the community or who have other employment and who are willing to give their time to share their business expertise with others. Um, and here's our community if, champion right here. If I got paid, <laughs> I wouldn't be working with government. <laughs> I can tell you that I do do a lot of work, and and I think it's just that I have a great passion for this region and, and the things that I do. And I don't really call myself a champion because I do rely on a lot of other individuals. But in terms of um, outside of our committee now, you know, we're able to access different funds and so on. But I am aware of, like, our local uh, CBDC, uh, a few years ago, they did put in place, um, I guess, a, a type of program, and Jamie LaRue is here, he can speak on that, whereby you can, a social enterprise, if you have a business idea, you have a good business plan, those kinds of things, um, they do have some programming that is available for anyone who is interested in setting up a social enterprise. Of course, they still need the typical business plan, those kinds of things. So that there is one source that we are, you know, aware of right now, and and I totally agree with Penny. It's something that, um, you know, moving forward, if we, you know, want enterprises like this to succeed and build, we do need more access to funds for sure. Great. We have a question or comment here, and then one up here. Oh, okay. I'm de I'm delighted this morning to have this opportunity to be here. Uh, I, I've been fortunate over the last number of years and as part of the community of uh, St. Jack's Coombskull, and I'm from English Harbor West, serving on, uh, been a talk about volunteer, I think I've been a full-time volunteer uh, since my retirement 17 years ago. And I've served on health boards and education boards and rural secretariat and CVDC. Uh, and uh, it was just mentioned about social enterprise lending, and of course, Jamie may speak to that. He's the, our CEO, but I still have that board. Uh, my thing about uh, some of the things I was mentioned this morning, particularly in terms of champions, is that, uh, you know, I think that's very key. And I find particularly uh, in our leadership, some of our leaderships are a bit hesitant about that championship thing they uh, uh, they're restrictive in in the meaning of community and I think uh, in terms of rural Newfoundland now we need to broaden our perspective of what's a community and uh, and we need to take some risk in being leaders uh, and I think sometimes uh, you know that, that that's uh, that's probably holding us back somewhat and uh, the other thing uh, is the partnership thing, and I think, you know, that's essential. Somebody mentioned partnership this morning, and I think that's essential uh, for the future of rural Newfoundland, remote rural areas like ourselves, partnering with education, towns, recreation. This is the only way to move forward and grow, and I just wanted to uh, mention those few things, see your response to that. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to go first. Um, oh, oh, go ahead. Yep. It's so true, Hubert, because when you're looking at looking for champions and leaders and so on, uh, many of our organizations are struggling with people to take things on. And how do we, like when I'm ready to give up, there's good many days when I want to throw it down. And it's like, okay, who's going to take this up? And we're not building that. And it seems like the generation that's with us now with a lot of the young people, they don't want to be committed 
to a particular organization and attending meetings and being responsible for making decisions and you know handling money and those kinds of things that is a big issue and it's something that I think you know not just like it's in our region that we have to work towards and everybody's got something to offer and that's a, that's what we got to make people realize everybody's got something and you know I was talking to somebody uh, about the gathering there this morning with Natalie and, and Linda and like there was a lady there she was in her 70s and she made a comment about well I can't do very much but I can cook and I can feed people so that's what her job was as part of the gathering so the, everybody's got something and I know there was a vision that I had at one point for this region is that the volunteer base and to identify who all of our volunteers are and what skills and their abilities that they have. Because like with our Lions Clubs, for instance, there's always, they, they change their executive every single year. It's part of their, their constitution. And, you know, they were really challenged in terms of who was going to be doing this and this and this. So, you know, it's something I think as our region we can do is figure out what volunteer base we got and what everybody can do. You know, like I'm stretched from here to everywhere and there's only so much people can do, but I've learned really well over the years to delegate and uh, make other people accountable as part of your committee. So I've improved my, uh, my skills that way as well. So we'll get there. Natalie or Penny on this one? Yeah, I, I would just add that I think one of the big challenges is volunteer burnout. Um, and so that has to be managed really wisely. You want to make sure that you get people doing things that they um, want to do and that they're good at and not um, overtaxing certain individuals and um, so I think it is about managing your volunteers and really thinking about where they create value and how you can um, have them um, you know feel like they're contributing sometimes volunteers give a lot of their time but they don't necessarily feel recognized and so finding ways to recognize volunteers Any? I'd just like to make a, a number of comments, Rob. I mean, first of all, social enterprise is very different than other kinds of nonprofit activities. And I just want to keep underscoring that over and over and over again. You need different kinds of people. You need people who are business people. You need people who can access funding. You don't just run it like you do another nonprofit. And so while the volunteer element is critically important, where it is primarily important in my view in lifting a social enterprise as a social enterprise as I've defined it off the ground is at the board level at the governance level um, and that is where there's a huge challenge mm -hmm. uh, but if you can't pull that together at the outset then my recommendation would be don't even start the process social enterprise is difficult Social enterprise organizations fall flat on their face very often. In the private sector, when you fall flat on your face, you get a pat on the back, you dust yourself off, and you go along and do something else and make yourself a lot of money because you learn from your failures. That's counterintuitive to the way that we work in the nonprofit sector. We can't, how do you dust yourself off if you're using somebody else's money? It's a huge challenge. And failure is something you try to hide, not something you don't fail forward very often in our world, right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to get a lot better at being able to figure out how it is okay to fail. Yeah. But you can't fail unless you have some protection. So organizations that want to get into social enterprise, in my view, better figure out a way to have some money in the bank and to have their people who are going to be engaged highly skilled and highly trained. CSC did a lot of research around this subject around 2005, 2006, where we went all around the province. We spoke to organizations everywhere from you know, CBDCs who were very reluctant to lend unless people were putting mortgages on their houses up for the equity. I mean, there's a lot of very different challenges in running a social enterprise and being a private business. But one of the things that we learned is that in some cases we had boards that were willing to be entrepreneurial and they didn't have staff who could step up to the plate or we would hear from an executive director they were ready to step up and learn how to run their organization like a business but they couldn't get any movement from their board well that's not because there was a a big divide between the two groups it's because we don't have the policy framework that permits us or enables us to move forward and until 
I, and I'm going, happily going on the record about this, until we get our provincial government into a mindset, and a COA too, but I think we have to start with our provincial government, that they have to make investments that are risky. And when you think about anything the private sector does, the successful ones, don't go up the middle and not push on the edges, right? But in the nonprofit sector, so it applies to social, everybody wants us to be in the middle where we're not going to take any risks. So if you don't take any risks, you're not going to get the big wins. So we have to figure out how we can get that investment fund in place, which is to me the major thing we need in this province, that will seed some of this kind of invitation. And maybe some of the oil companies, if we get better community benefit agreements and better procurement policies in place, can be helpful. But we're not getting anything done if we don't get the provincial government on board on this subject. And they've committed themselves in their blue book. We have something to hang our hat to. And what we need is a whole lot of people pushing this agenda. I'd just like to add one thing, if you don't mind. Uh, one thing, and this is an important piece of information that I didn't include in my presentation, but that I now realize it would have been an important piece of information to include, is that the Shorefast Foundation has partnered not only with the community, but they've partnered as well with government, and uh, with the provincial government and with ACOA. And so I think that there is a bit of an appetite for governments to to, um, to invest in social enterprises like the Shorefast Foundation, um, and they invested a lot of money. They each put in $5 million into the Shorefast venture. So, and so I think that shows that there is, there is some appetite there, and hopefully, like Penny said, it will grow and, and get, uh, get bigger. So that comes to the issue of you've got to think big and you've got to think bold. I mean, there are all kinds of small uh, social enterprise activities we can get engage in, but if you're trying to come together as a group of communities in a region for regional development, mm -hmm. then you've really got to get that big picture in your mind, and you've really got to go after it. We have, uh, I moderated the mayor's debate for the Northeast Avalon about a month ago, and I'll tell you, it was easier to keep time there than, this is a <laughs> passionate topic and a, a lot that's, of content. That's just because you're so fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> And you're listening for a change. Right? Yeah, well, this is true. I'm actually learning something here. <laughs> I like that. No, no. Uh, we have two questions or comments. We'll keep them brief. And I'll hold the panel until both are made. And then you'll make your final responses. Mm -hmm. And we'll clue up for a break. And then we'll start the regional workshop. Uh, I have two. Since this is a fishing, I'm Charmaine Allen. I'm doing fisheries research in this area. Uh, we're smack in the middle of a, a, a fishing area of Newfoundland. And if there's one area of social enterprise that has been absolutely absent, or I guess two of them have been absent to, to each other. Since the moratorium, there were huge opportunities in this province to engage in social enterprise in the fisheries. And we haven't done it in very, and I'll, I'll speak to one of the situations in a minute, but. There were so many opportunities for social enterprise to engage in, in the fishery from the provincial, federal level, level and, and on the local levels to do, do something different, and we didn't do it. Huge missed opportunity. None of your presentations today talk about the fishery again. I did mention Sabri yes, and I'm going to ask yeah. you in a minute yeah. to speak to that because I think it's important. Mm -hmm. But I just want for the record to know, to, for you to know that when Fishery Products International pulled out of Harbor Breton a few years ago, this community tried to get that quota from FPI to develop somewhat of a social enterprise situation that was flatly turned down by the federal and the provincial government. And I think if we don't start thinking about social enterprise when it comes to fisheries and small scale fisheries in particular, you're going to see, first of all, you won't have a small scale fisheries in any way, shape, like in any major uh, form in Newfoundland within the next 10 to 15 years. And I absolutely believe that's going to happen in this region if we don't soon think differently. But Ms. Rowe, I would love for you to, to briefly tell this audience about the wonderful success story in Sabri, because it could have happened in Arbor Breton, it could have happened in other communities in the Costa Bays, it could have happened all around this province, but the will wasn't there for DFO, and the will wasn't there from the provincial government either. But I would love for you to tell this audience about that. Well, I know, Rob, you're running out of time. But just uh, take just a minute very, on that. Very briefly, Sabri was set up uh, when the fishery failed in uh, St. Anthony area. 
they got lucky, they got a quota, they got a 5% of the shrimp quota, I think. I'm told now, every time I raise this issue with provincial government officials, there's no bloody way anyone is going to get a quota. And it's exactly what happened in Port Union. I said, you know, they could make something happen if they could get a quota. But there's no, it's why I'm so adamant that this requires provincial government policy rethinking. But Sabri is a fabulous example. It set up this nonprofit corporation and they uh, have an organization that does its work in the fisheries. Any profits they make come back into the community and for community benefit. So once they've paid their bills, the profits aren't going out of the province. The profits are staying in the community. And they've partnered with all kinds of other organizations to be the supplementary cash for trails and for recreation. They're doing community scholarships. So somebody said that's, I think it was you, Natalie, that that's <laughs> drawing people out. But nonetheless, people do need to be educated. And it's an opportunity that young people should be given. But I'd recommend to you to go on to my website, the Community Sector Council, nl.ca. We did a fabulous piece of work last year around the social return on investment, and we worked with 12 community-based organizations. Sabri was one of them. And what we learned from this year-long review process with them was that the benefit they got was they were actually able to quantify the value of their work in terms of people being willing to stay and remain in that community. And it was a fascinating piece of work. Uh, so. It's, it's dense and it's hard, and I can't say any, any more about it now, but it's a story that people need to know. And I'm just going to wrap up here, Rob, because I was at a function with the heads of municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador, one night, and I'd been speaking to the mayor of St. Anthony for years about the nonprofit sector in another at the Provincial Rural Secretariat Council and social enterprise, and he never made a connection with what I was talking about and what Sabri was doing. And he was going around saying to other communities, why don't you consider what Sabri is doing? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people have good stories. Sabri is an excellent one. And I know I've had them on the national circuit a little bit and talking uh, around the province. It's a story that needs to be told, but it was all contingent on the quota in just the same way as the shrimp company in Labrador and Torngatha Co-op. And just, I don't know if anybody mentioned, Sabri is St. Anthony Basin Resources, Inc. Inc. Okay, one last question, then the panel can respond to the question or make their closing comments. No, I'll make a, my original comment, and I'll take Penny on one, one of her comments about the CBC in a minute. I respect <laughs> everything that you do, Penny. That was before your you were time. That, that's, and I'll actually, uh, I respect everything that Community Sector Service does and Sector Council does, but uh, I wanted to address that afterwards. But a quick comment is, is that, uh, as I already mentioned, the CBDC, like Gail alluded to, does do financing. Uh, for social enterprises as well, and we've been promoting that, and, and really, that's really in the back end because everything that they're talking about here today on the front end, that community engagement and champions and everything else is where it's at, uh, and all that funding at, at the front end in terms of uh, non-repayable funding, fundraising, you've got to do all that, but on the back end, when you start operating, you might need some operating capital, uh, the things that you need for your operation once you become operational, if you're a new enterprise and ongoing if you're an existing one. We have that, and that's a very small piece. It's just a tool that we have, because everything else is done actually by the social enterprise. Uh, to address the CBDC comment, and of course, there could be situations that could be valid what you're saying. There's, there's a network of 15 CBDCs in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, our CBDC, to speak to what we do, uh, in the last dozen years, we've lent nearly $13 million on $2 million that was given to us in terms of our fund, government fund, which is worth $5 million today. That was done on risky loans, which have taken a chance. No mortgages on personal homes in doing that. And we've done a couple of co-op uh, loans before, and no guarantees at all or anything of that nature taken, some security taken from social enterprise. And within the network of CBDCs, there have been 15 to 20 social enterprise loans, none that I'm aware of that has personal uh, guarantees or uh, sometimes it could be limited, depending on if it's an industry association or something like that, depending on the nature of the social enterprise, but none in terms of... Uh, requiring directors and volunteers to, uh, to my knowledge, are the ones that I'm aware of, at least a dozen or so in the last three or four, six years that has been done in Newfoundland where that was required. Just want to address that. And they're not saying that there's been situations or even impressions that may not be accurate or maybe accurate, but it's a big network that are autonomous and run by local boards. I want to speak to our local board and those that I'm aware of in terms of those situations. Thank yeah. you. So 
in a rich, full panel, you can respond to that particular point or and or I will, I will respond because I quite, you're quite right that the CBDCs operate and function differently in different parts of the province. But it was when Paul Martin was Prime Minister and got very engaged in what was we were then calling social economy and social economy enterprises that he actually made it virtually mandatory for government lending agencies to work differently with nonprofits. So we started to see a huge shift across many of the organizations then. But I know years ago there was a great pride taken by some lending organizations that they had money left at the end of the year they hadn't lent. And there were a lot of people saying, if you're not lending your money and you've got money left over, then you're not taking enough risk. Anyway, we can have a cup of coffee. Well, and this is probably coming from Austin, too. You're right. And it wasn't in our contract until the government would have did that. We were controlled by land and opportunity agency in our operation agreements and until they opened up that door. And actually, our board actually opened the door before they did it. Mm. Yeah. So, okay. uh, great. Okay. Natalie, last comment. Uh, so I'd just like to wrap up by saying that um, Although, um, you know, Penny did make the comment about uh, policy being behind here in Newfoundland ar around social enterprise, I do think there's a tremendous opportunity here because there's such a community spirit and at an attachment to place in Newfoundland that you don't necessarily see in other parts of Canada. So while you might have more kind of entrepreneurialism happening in other parts of the country, you don't necessarily have as much of a desire to make a, a social, you know, a, a difference in society. And I think there is a wonderful opportunity here in Newfoundland and Labrador to pursue social entrepreneurship. Gail, last comment. Uh, other than thanks everybody for coming out. Um, there was a lot that I didn't say that I could have said about our group. And uh, just going forward, just build those partnerships, uh, you know, engage your community. And, uh, you know, I'm here if anybody in the region would like to, you know, to contact me. I'll be getting up and doing my day job in second. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have a wonderful place here in Coast Bays. Every organization has something that they offer. And uh, we have to learn from one another. And I think that's one thing that we have to do as well in this region is uh, start uh, more partnerships among our communities. Not just within our communities, but among the 22 communities that we have. So it's, it's a wonderful place. And we have a full day together, and uh, this topic, I'm sure, will percolate throughout the day. And we're going to have all breakouts this afternoon, so there's going to be lots of opportunity to draw on this expertise. I didn't mean the CBDC comment to be my last comment. Oh, sorry, Penny. <laughs> I did say and or. If you'd like a quick final comment. <laughs> Anyway, just to let you know, I've left some materials on the table over there uh, and some work that CSC has been doing around social enterprise where we've been bringing in some international experts to motivate conversation, giving you the link to our website where you can find all kinds of really good resources. Uh, and just to let you know that uh, as an organization, we're very committed to this topic in terms of promoting policy, uh, but we are now in the process of forming a working group so that we can bring together people from different uh, perspectives to really push this agenda and learn what we need to learn. And finally, just to tell you that in 2014, we will be doing a survey, uh, our second survey of non uh, social enterprises in the province so that we can have a really good appreciation of the kind of organizations that exist and the kind of ways in which they're earning their revenue. Thank you, Penny. And thanks to the panel. Please join me. Fantastic job.